thanks so much for coming out this afternoon. Um, I want to welcome you to the Dana L. Wiley Gallery. Um, my name is Dana Wiley, and today we are here uh, for the panel discussion featuring the artwork from the exhibition by Jennifer Rosengarten entitled Something Beautiful. Um, I want to thank Jennifer and all our distinguished panelists who have taken the time out of their day uh, to share with us their views on the topic, what is the work that beauty does? Um, so I want to thank Jennifer um, for working with us to have this exhibition in the gallery. It's been um, a, a pleasure to get to know you, Jennifer, and throughout this process, and I just appreciate the opportunity to share um, your work with our community. Um, I think I met Jennifer about a year and a half ago, two years, something. The library. Yeah, yeah, it's a little while ago. Um, and um, I had the chance to go out to her studio, uh, which I can say is surrounded by a lot of, a lot of beautiful uh, moments in nature. And I was able to talk with her about her thoughts on the exhibition. Um, I was intrigued and inspired by her artwork that's created with an attempt to capture light and breath and beauty. Um, I feel this exhibition gives us a connection through these elements to that which is meaningful um, beauty is not merely for the sake of being aesthetically pleasing. Um, beauty has the power to inspire feelings of love, peace, and joy. It can drive us to express our own creativity and to foster a deeper connection with our surroundings and certainly with the relationship, relationships we have in our lives. Um, so at this time, I usually talk a little bit about the gallery, but I really just want to give the panel as much time as possible. Um, I will say that we are a retail art gallery, and we do keep our doors open through sales and donations. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, Gary, uh, Ashley, and Rabab. They're in the back there, so thank you to them. Um, so again, I want to say thank you to our incredible panel. Um, it is an honor to have you all here. Um, I believe Jay will serve as our moderator, um, and we will have a brief Q&A session after the, the panel concludes. Um, so I'll get started with um, Jennifer Rosengarten. Jennifer is a graduate from Wright State University with a major in fine arts in 1989. She then attended the Vermont Studio School, studying, studying with Bernard Chait and Wolf Kahn before heading to Boston University with a full fellowship to study painting. At BU, she worked with John Walker, John Moore, and Ann Harris. She completed her MFA in 1993, and upon graduating, she was awarded the prestigious Esther B. Kahn Career Entry Award. Jennifer's work is part of many private and public collections, uh, including the Springfield Museum of Art, Springfield, Ohio, the Jewish Hospital in New York City, and Premier Health Corporate Offices, Dayton, Ohio. Jennifer has exhibited her work in several galleries and institutions, including the Munson Gallery, Santa Fe, the Dayton Visual Arts Center, and the Springfield Museum of Art. Um, next on the panel, we have Stephen Kahn um, at the end. He is a uh, W.E. Smith Professor of History at Miami University, Oxford, Ohio. He is the author of numerous books, including Do Museums Need Objects Anymore? Professor Kahn has published dozens of essays in Columbus Dispatch, The Cleveland Plain Dealer, The Christian Science Monitor, and The Philadelphia Inquirer. He is a regular contributor to The Huffington Post and The Chronicle of Higher Education. Next, we have Jean Kohler. Jean is a painter, educator, and consultant. Her work has been the subject of articles and publications such as American Artist, and her paintings are part of private and public collections including the Evansville Museum of Art, Evansville, Indiana, the Ohio Supreme Court, Columbus, Ohio, and the Hoyt Institute of Art, Newcastle, Pennsylvania, among others. Next on the panel, we have Nason Maclergy. Uh, Nason Nic Nicolargy. So sorry. Nason is a potter and owner of Miami Valley Pottery. His work was featured on MPR's Morning Edition with Noah Adams and then exhibited at the Southern Ohio Museum of Art, Portsmouth, Ohio, the Sherry Gallery and Ann Miller Gallery, Columbus, Ohio. His functional pottery can be found at fine dining establishments internationally. And next we have, um, as our moderator and panelist, Jay Rothman. Um, Jay is uh, an educator, mediator, facilitator, and speaker and author. Rothman has held academic positions, including most recently as visiting associate professor at the School of Global Policy 
and Strategy at UC San Diego and served as the founding director of the Jerusalem Peace Initiative at Hebrew University. He is president and founder of ARIA Group and an organization that facilitates creative engagement with conflicts in nations, organizations, and communities. So um, now I will turn things over to Jennifer. Um, but please welcome our guest today. Terry Walker uh, designed for me. I'm very grateful for it. It's full of light, air, space. You couldn't ask for an extra studio. But for the past couple of years, I have just felt kind of, uh, last three years, kind of down. And even that lovely space, kind of dark, depressed. And I think it was just really about what was going on in the world uh, at the time. And so my work has always been a way to figure out how I'm going to be and act in the world. And my work prior to this point, they were the similar sub subject of gardens and ponds, but they were much more dense, tangled masses that you couldn't really get through. The darks were very opaque, so you couldn't pass through them. And so what I just began to search for was this kind of light and air and space. I just felt like I couldn't breathe. And they really started to reflect that the, the physical space that I was in. Um, so I guess I just wanted to point out a few things in the painting when I'm talking about the darks. So I don't think you can see how they're, they're kind of transparent here. And if you look over here, you can sort of see through them. And for me, in my artist statement, I think I said something like, you, know, you, can, you can still see through it, you can get around through it, you can move, move through it. Um, it isn't sort of an impenetrable mass. And I guess for me, it was just kind of a metaphor, and I didn't really realize this since I was writing my artist statement. Um, and you guys, who here's an artist, and how much do you love writing an artist statement? So, <laughs> try to make yourself sound really smart, and your work really important. Um, so I was writing this statement, I was trying to be really erudite and find something to say. And I spent like days and days and weeks on it, and I asked opinions for, from everybody. And then I just said, you know, I just want to paint something beautiful. And at that moment, I felt kind of maybe embarrassed, but also a little defiant. Um, I'm not really sure. Well, the way the reason I felt that way, I think there's been some sort of shift in our culture and in history and art history, and I think Steve's going to talk about this more, about why that shift occurred, but that I, it, it's not enough to make something that, that's just beautiful. But with the way that the world is right now, I really felt deeply in my heart when I was writing that, that it does have a kind of power when you're making it and when you're experiencing it. So, um, so I started to think that, oops, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about being in the world and it feels to me like the whole world is kind of stuck in its amygdala brain, um, that sort of baser brain that's reactive. And if we think about our political climate, if we think about COVID, um, if we think about what's happening in the world, I mean, I really just can't believe that we're still in this space where we're doing the kinds of things that we're doing to each other. Um, so, so, I found this quote by John Adams. I'm just gonna, second president, right, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> And basically what he said was, I want to study war and politics, I'm paraphrasing this, so that my children can study uh, philosophy, mathematics, and a couple other things. But basically, so then my grandchildren, thinking ahead, could study poetry, painting, uh, statuary, which is basically sculpture, music, uh, philosophy, and I'm thinking, okay, how many, what are we like 200 years behind schedule? Because we're, sti we're still at war in politics. So I really feel like we need to, to flip that around and maybe we need to think about 
how do we get back to beauty and um, trying to figure that out how, how we do that in our lives. And so that's what I've been thinking about. Um, Two minutes. Are you kidding? <laughs> I'm going to take the longer because I'm the star of the show. <laughs> okay, so, so Mike began asking myself this question, what, what does beauty do? Do. What does it do for us? Well, there's been a lot of neurological research about what duty, beauty does to your brain. So, can you guys do me a favor and just close your eyes for a minute? Really? Everybody? <laughs> Everybody? Dorothy? <laughs> and I just want you to take a minute and think about a beautiful experience that you had. It doesn't have to be a piece of art. Anything. Just close your eyes, really. Okay, you can open your eyes now. Was there a change in your body when you did that? When you thought about it, did you have a change? Well, there's a, there's a lot of proof that there's a physiological and a neurological change in our bodies when we experience beauty. If you think about your amygdala brain, you're reactive, but when you're thinking about being in your peaceful place, you slow down, you contemplate. Nobody did anything good in a state of panic, anxiety, fear, or anger. So I think it's a really valuable thing to bring ourselves back to this uh, idea of beauty. So everybody watched the Oscars and saw the Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer and everything. Well, actually, I'm going to bring Oppenheimer up again, sort of. Um, so I'm going to tell you about one of my most beautiful, profound moments uh, with, with a piece of art. And it was, I think, 19, late 90s or uh, early, yeah, late or early, yes, around there, late 90s. And it was at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and I saw a retrospective on Cezanne. And does anybody know those paintings of Montemptor, those paintings? Well, I didn't understand it then, but I knew this might be the last time I saw that series of paintings all at once. And I actually couldn't leave them. I really kept trying to leave, and I would come back. And I actually got very emotional. I mean, a guard came up to me and asked me if I was OK. Um, but I didn't understand what I was looking at them. But I had the sense that what they looked like, and I brought a couple books so you can look at them later, but he's painting so there are pieces of everything. Cezanne understood quantum physics before following Oppenheimer, I think. But, um, Basically, that everything is shifting and moving, and everything is part of everything else. So what you see is in the ground, you see pieces of blue from the sky. These sort of flowing facets, just sort of interchanging and mingling. And that's exactly what quantum physics is about. And that's exactly what Alfred Bohm, that same philosophy, they were both kind of trying to come up with a new world order about how things look and act in the world, and it had to do with these small particles. But I guess what I'm saying is, when I look at Cezanne, it's a choice that we make. We can choose to follow the path of beauty, or literally, we can choose to make a bomb, right? That idea has the power to do both things. So why don't we flip that on its head and follow beauty? <laughs> That beauty does? That's really a fascinating, <clears throat> fascinating question. Because clearly it, it impacts our feelings, it enables us to be present, close your eyes, imagine beauty, we relax. But what is the work that beauty does? Jennifer's focus and invitation through the four of us to, that this exhibition is about finding air, white, light space, openness, and ease as a way through all the pessimism and pain of recent months and years that all of us individually and collectively have been experiencing. As Dana says, how can beauty bring us into love and peace and joy? And I think we're all here to say yes to that invitation. And I'm inviting a panelist, including me, 
to speak first person reflexive, introducing ourselves, our work in the world, and how we respond to Jennifer's beautiful invitation, invitation to reflect on something beautiful. And this point towards what is the work that beauty does. I'll start in a second, then I'll invite Mason, and then Steve, and then Jean, and then I'll wrap a little bit up with some questions to us, and then open it up to you for comments and questions. Finishing in about 45 minutes. So as a youth, I grew up in Yellow Springs. I saw myself as an artist and a musician, but life had a sort of a different idea for me. And I studied international relations and I became an international mediator. And my mother conflict is Jerusalem. But I've always continued to be inspired by the arts. My work is called Aria, which means song. And all the work that I've done, I've tried to use the arts to help. That didn't feel quite right. I didn't want to use the arts. I somehow wanted to imbibe or engage the arts. So 40 years later, I found myself in Jennifer's studio learning to paint, and that was about three years ago. And now, beauty and art are infusing itself in my work, even more than wanting to do it. It has just happened. And I'll give you an example. This afternoon, I'm going to mediate a very complex conflict that I've been working on for almost a month, and I'm stuck. And I've been stuck. And I've been cogitating about that while I've been preparing for this. I've been reading all sorts of books. I've been reading John Dewey on art. I've been reading this fascinating book uh, by, uh, I'm forgetting his name right now, it's called Art Science, which is a little bit what Jennifer was saying. That, that, that in a sense, art can inspire science and give science a more of a creative imagination, hopefully, towards constructive ends. That's what this book is talking about. So I'm reading all this, and I'm cogitating about what I'm going to do with this mediation, how I'm going to start it off. I've also been studying piano, and I've been studying a particular piece of piano by Bill Evans. Anybody know the jazz musician Bill Evans? He has an amazing piece called Peace, Peace. So a piece piece about this. And it's an amazing piece. I invite you to go listen to it. It starts about four minutes of resonance, of engagement, of play, and then it starts asking some questions. And the questions get you to sort of stop and you're a little bit, I get a little tense, and then it's resonant, and it's dissonant, and it's really confusing, and it's almost aggressive. And then it goes back to a question mark, States it there and you say, Is it going to be finished with the question? And then it resolves. So I'm going to invite my, my parties to listen to that piece of music. And then I'm going to ask them what they've, been, what they've heard. And then I'm going to suggest how it mirrors what we have been doing. We've had a lot of resonance, but we're stuck in this dissonance. And now it's their choice. Are they going to keep moving into that dissonance and antagonism? Or are they going to choose some way to resolve it? where together they can get out of their mess. It's their choice, but the piece of music and I as the facilitator of their dialogue will hopefully lead them into that direction. And I think that's what beauty can do to us. It can lead us into a direction. It can lead us to some choosing of how we're gonna respond and, and determine the pathways in front of us. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt said, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Right now it's a little bit hard for some of us to keep the beauty of our dreams. And so thanks to Jennifer and thanks to bringing us together and all of you together to reimagine the beauty of our dreams and create a different future. And with that, Mason. Can I stay seated? I think you should probably be stand, not to be here, but folks in the back might not see it. Um, I'm Nason McLarge. I'm a potter at Miami Valley Pottery in Yale Springs, Ohio. And I'm going to speak as a potter um, and as the husband of a mid nurse midwife. And the reason I bring this up is because um, we in our house try to live with beauty. We try to surround ourselves with beauty. And 
it's it's more important to me to do that because because I think of it as a catalyst in my work because I take my work very seriously. I'm part of a tradition, a lineage of potters um, who have worked a certain way, who lead, who believe in a philosophy that's based on a, a concept, a, a Japanese concept of minge, which is that you're working as a potter or as an artist, as a craftsperson, and you're part of a lineage, part of a tradition that thinks of itself um, without, without an identity, really. You want to think of a lineage of the unknown craftsman, somebody who's making work uh, as a lot of work that is meant to be used on a daily basis. On a daily basis where you're thinking about incorporating beauty into your everyday function. So, and I do this as a potter, I do this with my customers in a very subtle way. When I talk about the pottery, I talk about this tradition, the kiln, um, the fact that I'm a production potter, but I also try to incorporate the concepts of beauty in the conversation, and if it, if it leads to it, I bring them into the house, and I show them how the decisions we make in our house are thought with beauty in mind. <clears throat> So we don't like to have plastic in our house. We want to look and use things that inspire us with touch, with a daily use. And it, it does affect the way you function throughout the day, okay? So Jennifer asked, how can we make change in the work that we do? And I think of it the reason I brought up my wife, I think of her work, it's obvious how important her work is as a midwife. She affects change immediately, and it's super important in, in the daily life of, of us as citizens. The work that I do is much more uh, subtle, but if you go to museums, you see that it really is important to make beautiful things that are part of our culture that we use on a daily basis. And we're not looking for it to end up being in a museum, but if you're creating it with the right intention, it's part of that daily process of using beauty, okay? Um, there's, I, I did a study of Persian ceramics. Uh, when we were living in England, my wife was getting a PhD and I would go to the Victoria and Albert Museum almost every day because it was so inspiring. And it's beautiful. The museum is beautiful and it, it, it brings that into your forefront, into your mind. And in the research that I did, there's, there's a, a story of a potter who was working um, in, in, uh, in Iran and we on the border of Syria and as the Mongols were coming in the 13th century, he buried all of his pieces. And then the Mongols came, uh, ruined the village. He died. 800 years later, those pieces were brought up. And it's, it's the, the idea of him thinking about uh, burying these pieces because they had so much meaning to him and the the beauty, because they obviously they were important, beautiful works and they ended up in museums, but it, if you can imagine the getting back to the concept of the, um, the unknown craftsmen and the minge movement from Japan, that you're, you're working and surrounding yourself on a daily basis, and if this continues over generations, it's a way to make the, the community a better place. And, and that's what I try to do as a potter, is bring people into our home, bring people into the idea of, our, of the tradition that I work in as part of this lineage, because I do think about beauty on a daily basis. And, and, and I think as a culture, we don't do it enough. We are in the habit of not thinking about beauty because of our schedules. We were in Italy this last summer, and Jelana said, 
we're in an old uh, Italian village that obviously was beautiful. It, there was a lot of thought that went into it. And her comment was, why, why do we now build uh, strip malls when you could have this? <laughs> and it's true, it's like we, we have let it slip in our society and we don't think about beauty enough. And the small part that I can do as a, a potter, as a craftsperson, is to try to bring it into people's homes and to try to get the customers to think about beauty on a daily basis. Because it is a way to think about how you live your life and how you relate to other people also. Two minutes. I think I'm done. <laughs> so as Dana said, I am a history professor at Miami. Uh, that means two things most immediately. First, I'm not going to talk quite as personally as my colleagues have here. I'm going to talk more historically. It also means that I'm going to have to speak for 55 minutes because it's not <laughs> bad. Uh, and I apologize for that, but you know, you push a button and the tape starts to go. Uh, I think what I want to try to do is maybe provide a little historical context, a personal take on some of the questions that have already been raised. Why was it, Jennifer, that you were feeling that somehow beauty wasn't adequate, wasn't enough in art? Why is it, Nason, do you think that we have ignored this issue, as you've described it, uh, in our daily lives, and our own experiences. So let me try to pull a lens back and, and go maybe to 30,000 feet here to, to maybe put this in some context. I want to start with the, I think, sort of small question of what, what is the purpose of art after all anyway? Uh, and when I thought about that historically, I started to think about a couple of categories. Uh, art has been devotional. Uh, if we think about altarpieces and icons and, um, and other work, uh, works of art that are used as part of spiritual practices of one sort or another. Art has been documentary. Uh, we can think about uh, all the portraits that once got painted of people as records of themselves or their loved ones. Uh, we, you know, you can see those in museums uh, uh, all, all on the walls. Art has been didactic. It has taught lessons, or at least that's its purpose. I'm thinking in particular of the 18th century tradition of history painting, which was designed to impart certain kinds of moral lessons about, about heroism or about leadership or about nationalism, all those sorts of things. And art has also been a way to convey the beautiful. Uh, which is what we're here to talk about today. It has afforded artists an opportunity to express their conception of what is beautiful and then to engage viewers with that in a kind of dialogue uh, when, when you look at that. In this sense, artists do, and I, I'm thinking not just of visual artists, but all kinds of artists, uh, they do what art is supposed to do. They make what is ordinary, extraordinary, and vice versa. They make the, uh, the extraordinary seem quite ordinary. Beauty in this sense, it seems to me, is also connected to notions of pleasure. Uh, that this is ultimately maybe one way of describing uh, the neurological responses, the physiological responses we have, that, that sense of physical pleasure, of intellectual pleasure, emotional, spiritual pleasure. I think beauty is deeply connected to all of that. So I'm missing categories to be sure. Art has done other things as well. But as I was thinking about this panel, that's what occurred to me. So what happened to all of that, especially in the last, let's say, 100 years or 100 plus years? What has survived? the 20th century and 21st century in this sense of the function that art <clears throat> has traditionally served. Well, uh, art is now, I think, at least in the Western tradition, uh, not nearly as devotional as it once was. We do live in a secular and secularized world in which nobody much pays a lot of attention to altarpieces in the way that they might have once in a Renaissance or medieval world. 
the documentary purpose uh, function of art, uh, well, uh, has been replaced by the selfie stick. Uh, we don't, we don't uh, use art to document in the way that we once did, at least again in the West, really through the 19th century. Beauty, I think, became increasingly problematic for art after the First World War, and especially after the Second World War. And here again, I think, is the roots of why uh, some artists feel that, that to engage with beauty is somehow not quite where the art world has been. Uh, what I'm really talking about here is that the 20th century witnessed some of the most horrific uh, experiences that humanity has ever endured. And as the philosopher uh, Teodoro Adorno put it in 1947, it is barbaric to write poetry after Auschwitz. And, and that, I think, was a struggle that artists of all kinds, but especially visual artists, faced in the wake of those horrific tragedies. What's been left, it seems to me, is the didactic function of art. Uh, and, and here I'm thinking about just my own experiences of visiting galleries, of uh, going to exhibitions, where more and more it seems to me what artists want to do is to teach you a lesson, to moralize with you. Uh, for, uh, for one reason or another. Art now must somehow be seen as engaging with politics because politics is far too urgent to be ignored. Art uh, must somehow do political work because not to do that political work is to be irresponsible or to ignore the tragedies of the world or whatever, uh, whatever you have. Um, I think more and more when, when we look at uh, what's going on in the contemporary art world, this describes what artists uh, seem to be up to. I'll take this, I, and I just pulled this up this morning and I did so at random. This is the description of the featured exhibit currently on display at the Cincinnati Contemporary uh, down, down the road. Uh, I won't name the artist, but the artist here, and I'm quoting, works with painting, sculpture, installation, and film, that's quite a lot, uh, to explore the politics of emancipation through a feminist lens, unquote. In this, I think, uh, I, I think in this country in particular, the politicization of art, that is to say the idea that art must engage with politics or it is somehow not serious, is something we saw emerge in the 60s and 70s. I think it accelerated in the 1980s, and so here we are. In this, I think it has been difficult to find a place for that original function of art, that is to uh, express the beautiful, to engage with, um, with, with the experience of pleasure, uh, and to make us pause to contemplate just how extraordinary the ordinary in our lives can be. So that's my historical context for some of the issues that the rest of us are here to talk about. Thank you, Steve. So the hard part about going last is that you have all this in your head, and you've had something in your head before all this got to your head, so hopefully I will make some sense. And I do appreciate the comments about the mundane being more brought up to that level of beauty and exploration. And I think Jennifer and I share a lot of that because we look at what's around us and emphasize what we're seeing and translate that into our works. I am a maker as well as a painter. I don't feel like just a painter anymore, but I think that for those of you who know me, my first body of work that probably got shown the most was doing paintings of this building. I had a studio. They were the windows, the interior of my space, because that's what I saw every day. And then moving out, as Jennifer moved into her house too, I was surrounded by gardens and nature, which was a choice. Not that I didn't love being here, I did. It was quite an education socially, mentally, physically, you know, just trying to organize work and trying to make things. 
So the idea of beauty to me was to paint something, and I did a series of wood piles. And what I loved about that, when I finally began showing that work, is that people would come up to me and say, I can't look at a wood pile like I used to. You transformed how I saw it, how I did see it, how I'm seeing it now. And that, to me, is the ultimate idea about beauty. If you could bring something back up to a level that you're so conscious of it, which is what makes on all of you are saying, in our daily lives, like, what can I give you? You know, what is it that happens? And it is on our own intensity of what we want, what we're feeling, what we're seeing as we make things. And you're also struggling to be true to yourself trying to go through all the things that Steve talked about. I mean, I can't think about history when I'm painting. I can only think about, I mean, I can maybe carry those things in my head, but as soon as I keep making, then it goes away. You get involved in what you want and where you're going. And I understand the doubt, because once you've let that go, then you are expected to, to qualify it in some way. Or is it transactional, what you did? Or is it truly just your own spewing in some ways? And I think it's important that we're given that license and that we have that and that we can, you know, engage whether you do it early in life, later in life, in the middle of it, or all our lives, you know, it's like whatever your commitment is to it. And even in terms of looking or even going to galleries, I think it's really important. And I do think there's a difference that happens when you are in Europe and you're looking at how people live their lives compared to what we have here. But there's a lot here. There's a lot to be like tapped and used. And it's just a matter of deciding how you're going to do that as an artist, like what parts you engage in, you know, what discipline you decide to use or medium. You know, um, I think the whole idea about painting sculpture print making, all those are kind of barriers that have slowly been breaking down in the 20th to the 21st century and they all sort of blend and so that becomes another part of the conversation where it's not about skill, not about craft possibly, not about um, what you know. And I think with the idea of academia sort of like breaking down, I mean we're seeing what's happening with the humanities and they're kind of disappearing and being challenged and being pretty much taken to court, you know? And I feel like it's even more imperative that if you have a point of view or you have a love of what you're making, and if you do want something that's extremely light, airy, even though those words are not how I would always describe your work and what I've seen here, but I think there is something that, in context of what you've done before, I can see why you would choose those words. Because I think it takes a you don't have a lot of guts to paint flowers in the 21st century. You know, you gotta admit that. So, that's it. <laughs>
said that ultimately art is all about teaching. Um, and, and the teaching that I think Steve is, is asking us for is the teaching of the humanities, that you are, are moaning like the rest of us, is getting shorter and shorter shrift in our world that's transactional and materialistic and aggressive. So um, the emphasis on trying to surround ourselves and basically pay attention to what we want to attend to, as you're talking about, Jean. What medium you're going to use, what setting you're going to live in, what place you're going to create for yourself and invite people in. So uh, with that, open this up to any of you to comment or question each other or add another second or two that you didn't have a chance to add, and then open it up to you. Any, anybody want to say something? Well, I didn't feel like I got to my conclusions. <laughs> 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 So I was talking about Cezanne and Mole and the difference between the way they were thinking about the world and this idea of quantum physics. Remarkably, if you read about them, their dreams were very similar. It was it this wholeness and parts, and what do you do with that wholeness and parts? And one was a way of causing the, those parts to interact, they would become explosive. Right and create harm. But what Cezanne was on, he got frustrated in his life because he couldn't achieve the vision he wanted to achieve, which is what he saw when he looked. He was looking a little bit to the left. He could spend I don't know how many paintings did he make at that mountain, <laughs> hundreds, lots. But what what it is is that when I was talking about seeing the color from the ground and the sky and the sky and the ground, was what he understood was connection, right? Connection. That's what beauty does for us. It connects us. Okay. And I'm just going to read you this one last quote, and then well, you guys can. There it is. This is uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. It says, when the act of reflection takes place, we discover that our life is surrounded by beauty. Within us is the soul of the whole, the wise silence. That's what I wanted you guys to get in touch with when you were being quiet with your eyes closed. The, un, the universal, universal beauty to which every part and particle is equally related. When beauty breaks through our intellect, it is genius. When it breathes through our will, it is virtue. When it flows through our affections, it is love, 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 love. And beauty is love. Questions, comments, reflections. Yeah, um, I have four grandchildren, and they're all uh, early twenties. And this electronic age that they live in seems to not have any room for beauty and art. And I would so very much like to bring it to them in my old age, but uh, it seems like. It's a superficial kind of thing in there because they're busy with their with their with the electric age. And do you have any do you have any idea how one goes about you know uh, making this important, uh, finding beauty for young people, for people who are working on computers and grids and all kinds of things, but no. No real beauty. Maybe it should be flipped. Maybe you should ask them where the beauty is in that and try to be in their head to understand because what you're saying is probably what my mom said about me. You, you know, I mean, think about it. Like the idea of like your parents want one thing for you or grandparents, you know, and you kind of have to arrive at it your own way. With through your own mistakes, your yeah, own but choices. If, but your if they're so busy doing all these other things, how do they? I mean, I feel sad because I know how important art and beauty sure. is. I, I've always known that. To try to get my grandkids to absorb that and that interest is really hard. I would feel like I'm going to break down their right hair anyway. I, <laughs> okay. I, I was going to say, uh, before, before we came, there was a discussion with my wife about whether or not our children should be here. And my idea was, 
of course they should be here. Her idea was they're too young, they're not gonna be able to sit through it. But at what point in my life did, was I introduced to the concept of beauty? Mom, no offense. <laughs> it, it's, it's something that I really learned about in college because I was exposed to it as a philosophical conversation. And then it becomes part of my daily life. But children should be exposed to it. They should go to museums and they should be exposed to the concept of beauty. And even just talking about it, even bringing it up. On the way here, there was a hawk on Danielle Springs Road, sitting on the road, and some of you may have seen it. It's th Those are the things that kids should notice on a daily basis. If not, they're just sitting in front of their screen and then their life passes without even thinking about beauty. Yeah, I have a, can I just yeah, I'm just make a quick response to that hog tie them and drag them outside. <laughs> because it's the same kind of neurological processes that happen with with nature, being immersed in that, that quiet, that calm, that wise silence, is what happens when you encounter something beautiful. So that can make a kind of a segue. You know, you could you could, you know, rent a cabin somewhere and, you know, take their cell phones away and just make them I don't know. But I do think that nature is a conduit into beauty if it's if it's difficult. Mom, you get a response. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I took my grandson to a basketball game this morning, and he had his phone with him. So as soon as he got into the car, I said, Nico, I want you to put your phone away and talk to me. And while we were driving, I just kept showing him these beautiful flowers and, and trees and so eventually he got into it, but it took a while. <laughs> so I understand what you're saying. It's hard to get them back into beauty. I have a big question. To me, it's very important. Is beauty universal? Do you all hear that? Is beauty universal? Is that the whole question? I think in some instances there are, if you talk to listen to you know, Aristotle or Plato or truth, beauty, harmony, about design principles of harmony, unity, and order, and that sort of thing. But in this particular context about what can beauty do for us, it's it's more personal. It's whatever creates that pause, that space, that wise silence, that expansiveness, that I know when I sit out in the garden sometimes, one of my most beautiful experiences I think I've ever had is that morning doves, you know that call? I never understood why they call it morning, M-O-U-R-N. I always thought it was M-O-R-N because I find it such a beautiful and comforting sound. But what I feel is expansive and connected. So whatever brings that experience to you is how I was thinking about beauty in the context of this discussion. So I would, I would actually build on what Jennifer said about, about beauty as connection. And, and if you think about beauty as connection, so my work is what I call, I call my work creative conflict engagement. Other people call it conflict resolution, but I don't. Because it's not about solving conflict, it's about the fact that we have conflict with each other and we engage each other through that conflict. It's a kind of connection. But if we turn that connection from a negative connection over conflict to a creative connection, then that conflict becomes a source of connection. And, and in that sense, it's beautiful, right? So imagine that everything that we're doing can have a creative connection. I think I would add, because connection can be quite destructive. But in that sense, beauty and creative connection seems to be very universal. That's the human condition, that we want to somehow be able to be in creative connection with each other. I, I would just say, again, from my somewhat prosaic historian's point of view, I, I have always been struck by the universality of certain sorts of things, both across space and through time. Uh, I think there may actually be just something hardwired about this, but things which somebody made 8,000 years ago as beautiful strike us today still as beautiful. Um, so I do think there is a universality. I mean, there, there are particularities around the edges of this, but I think there is a core, that's at least my experience of, of studying the past and studying other cultures. I would like to 
to add, I was thinking the same thing, what Steve was saying. You go to museums and you're humbled by the things that people were, were able to create 800,000 years ago. You realize that it was part of the culture to create beautiful things because we were able to preserve them and we can see in museums that they did it and they incorporated it into their lives then. But the other part of it is that we as Americans don't travel enough. We don't go to see other cultures. We don't, most Americans don't know that beautiful things are made in other countries and have been made for hundreds and thousands of years. So in that sense, it, absolutely it's universal because it's all over the world and it's been happening for thousands of years. Do you wanna answer your own question? <laughs> oh, I guess to experience and to see the beauty of something, you need to have knowledge or experience of the culture, which in my view, it is seldom, seldom, or even the modern people, what we call the civilized people, the seldom they have knowledge of the other civilization. And in uh, their point of view, oh, I don't know about that. And therefore, I don't say, you know, just grab it up. I have a question for Steve. I really appreciate your perspective on the historic use of the word or the term or the idea of concept. Terry, can you say it louder? It's just right, hard right. to hear because there was one on outside bouncing. Right. Uh, I appreciate your. Uh, comments about uh, the historic view of the use of the term or the concept of beauty and in particular how um, you know what it, we've been through in the late 20th century to now uh, as a art student of the 80s we didn't use it's like you weren't allowed to use the word beauty in studio because it wasn't taken credible or right. something like that or just as too passe or it's uh, maybe even uh, you know, just avant-garde, not the zeitgeist, or whatever. I'm just curious as where you think we are now in that in history, because, I, I mean, from my view, looking back, even from the Renaissance or before, when art wasn't necessarily as tightly ingrained, it was more an intentional act of the, where they would co-opt beauty in the name of the church or other things like that, as opposed to being just integral with their culture, per se. And so where do we sit now? And is it okay to say, oh, that's beautiful? I mean, in studios, um, maybe the artists can say that in the yeah. academic world. You know, that's a, it's a struggle, I think, sometimes. I think it's easier in architecture because we always have seen where we're chasing beauty, you know? Mm -hmm. We talk about it, but not so much in the art world. I'm mean, I mean, just wondering, like, people like Rivera or Calo, you know, who. Mm -hmm. You used beauty in really good ways to talk about the common man. So. Yeah, so um, the, the first way I would answer that question, Terry, is to say I'm a historian and I have enough trouble with the past. Uh, <laughs> trying to make comments about the present or the future is, uh, is, is, is not what I'm good at. Uh, so one of the things that I might notice if I were going to sort of dig deeper into this is that the, 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 the backgrounding of the conception or the, or the function of beauty in art, which I think really does sort of coincide with the First World War, the 20th century, and, and all of this sort of stuff, um, I think has a gendered dynamic to it as well. I think beauty became seen as feminized, as heroic male artists were doing serious things that, uh, that were increasingly about delivering a didactic political message. Uh, I think that reaches a kind of high point in the mid 20th century and you know all of you know, the abstract expressionists who went around in muscle shirts and uh, splashing paint because they were so ag agonized and alcoholic. Um, 
I, I think, though, what, what has happened uh, in, in one direction is that the contemporary art world has opened up considerably to different kinds of people and therefore different kinds of visions and expressions, which is all to the good. Uh, but uh, witness what's going on uh, down in Cincinnati, and I make no comment on whether the art is itself any good or not, but I think what has happened is that uh, people of color, women in particular, um, have joined the contemporary art world on those male terms, by and large. Um, and that's, this is just my read of it. I am not expert uh, in any way about this. Um, but, but the idea is still that it's not sufficient just to do beautiful things if you aren't making an important political statement about the following. And that's what I read over and over again when I go to these contemporary shows. And it's as if, forgive me, because uh, I don't want to offend anybody in the room. Well, maybe I do. Um, but uh, I, what I've, I've noticed this corresponds to in, the increasing length of, of wall text in these museums, as if the artists themselves have lost faith in their own creations to express something. Now, I'm going to tell you in case you miss it, in case the art doesn't actually speak enough or strongly enough on its own, in case, again, the didactic function, you, you, this is what you have to think about it. So I, I don't know in the grand sense where we are, whether, whether it is now more exciting. I mean, I love the way Jean put this. It takes a certain amount of guts to paint flowers uh, in the 21st century. Um, that strikes me as one way of answering your question. I mean, just a quick follow-up then. I mean, the reason what I was trying to get at is that the, the, to paint or do sculpture or anything that's beautiful in the name or, or for the sake of beauty itself, period. I mean, is that too shallow? Or is well, as I said, my own sense of it is that that doesn't get you an exhibit at the Cincinnati Contemporary. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But, but, but I, as I said, I'm not a, I'm not an expert about any of this, and I don't. You know, and some of this other work I'm describing, I don't mean to denigrate it. Some of it may well be terrific. Some of it. I think is not going to have a very long shelf life. I think we're going to get bored of it pretty quick. Um, you know, there's there's a parallel you might draw uh, at, in, in, in another of the kind of uh, historical worlds I inhabit with socialist realism of the mid 20th century, right? Which was very didactic. It was very formulaic. It was making very very deliberate uh, political statements. Um, and we look at it now. It's interesting as a historical artifact, but as art. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that stuff really holds up very well. Yeah. Really, the universality of beauty. The uh, latter. My my question is: Is beauty a barrier? If we could present Miles Davis to someone from 1750, would they find it beautiful? Would these paintings be beautiful to the salon in 1820? Is the digital age going to reinvent beauty and 50 years from now, we will have a new aesthetic uh, appreciation for whatever. Yeah. What's particularistic and contextual and what's universalistic and forever? Right? Really the... Anybody have an answer? <laughs> <laughs> Well, what will be shown in the contemporary museums in 50 years, and whether the things that are in those museums now will still be shown, it's it's hard to tell. Who knows? Oh, yeah. and, and even even in our house, when things are brought into the house, there's a disagreement on what is beautiful. It, it's it's not not everything is universally categorized as beautiful, but but nature can answer differently. I mean, everybody agrees that a beautiful sunset or the mountain, and I, it's just hard to say with art, I think. I think we are kind of reevaluating that now, because if you think about, like our education was primarily Western art. We didn't get oceanic, all the other cultures, and I sort of had to catch up on my own in terms of doing, you know, finding those things, in terms of what is beautiful. I also think, too, when you're in a household and maybe you have the disagreements, you must have certain agreements about the things that you treasure. 
like between the two of you, or does the other person open your eyes to something else that you didn't see before? And so you go down that path. So to me, it's a really shifting thing always. I mean, even in our conversation, we're kind of like going to the ceiling and coming back down. And, you know, everyone has their own idea of what that beauty is because I don't think it's only defined by culture anymore. And with all the communication we have and all the things you can see, like it's Instagram, there's like tons of really crappy artists, in my opinion, <laughs> but tons of stuff that is so extraordinary, I wouldn't have ever thought of it. You know, and to me that's fodder, but at the same time, I have to close that out to figure out who I am in it as well. And I think that happens even in your own decisions, in your own studio, you know, what you have in front of you, what you choose to look at when you're making something or not look at. I mean, I have a love-hate relationship with Matisse. And there are times when I can only look at him, and times when he's part of something, there are times where I just want to burn the book I got. And I have too many on this anyway. But, you understand what I'm saying. I just feel like you go through, and even you addressed it in terms of what was happening in the world and how you made your own decisions. And the older you get, you kind of don't finish it. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you need two more, two more questions. Yes. Um, well, I'm reminded of Susan Sontag's uh, 1964 essay against interpretation. Um, that, that she, in such a prescient way, she addressed what we're talking about today. Then I had a question for Jennifer. Um, and, and looking at this work, I'm wondering about um, the role of intent and the role of the accidental and how those inform your idea of the, bringing the painting to the place that you want it to be. Well, what I was thinking about what the title of the show was it going to be intentional accidents or accidental intentions. I, I wasn't sure, but I'm trying to embrace that more because, you know, I kept making these paintings and I, and I would start something and it's like, oh my gosh, that is so beautiful, but it wasn't what I thought it should be, so I would lose it. So for the last couple of years, the most beautiful moments that were happening in my studio were on the palette how is mixing the paint for other paintings. So then I started trying to hang up those big sheets of palette paper on the walls and looking at those and saying, how can I, how can I use this? Okay, I'll try to get that color in the paintings. But then I just decided to start tearing them up. Um, and that's how those collages uh, happen back there uh, on that back wall. Um, so I think what I'm just trying to do is just, it's still me, whatever I'm doing. It's not if it's an accident, whether it's still filtering through my lens of my experience in the world, how I, how I move, what colors I choose, whether it's intentionally that way. And I feel like when it's intentional, it kills it. It kills it. And it really was an act of courage for me. Like there's one more, but those last three, there was one more on those last three. I had like a, a breakdown like 10 days before this show was supposed to. I was like, hating everything I was doing because I was trying to force it, finish on it, this idea, instead of letting it be its own thing and let it breathe. And and so, yeah, and so a friend said, well, just put those four pieces of yoga, yoga on the wall. Because that's what I, what I wanted, I said, I just want to put these up and I just want to make new paintings and I want to try to finish these awful things that are sucking the joy out of me and itself. And so I just, so I did, and that's what I did. Did I answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Yes. Me? Yes. Me? Yes. No. Two more questions. Well, I was going to say, um, I really appreciate this. Last thing that I was saying kind of undoes what I wanted to talk about, what I wanted to ask about, which is that we have three wonderful professional artists and craftsmen, as we were talking about saying, sitting on our panel. And um, I think that this question of Technique is really important. So we all, I think, agree that there are things in nature that we find beautiful. But in, um, in order to get that beauty onto the page or a little piece of pottery or to the wall, it takes a lot of effort and knowledge and technique. So in 1916, Richard Schwarzkopf wrote an essay called Art as Technique. 
And what he said, essentially, so what is the purpose of art? And this is you know, a year before the Russian Revolution, in the middle of World War I, when it seemed like everything was exciting, the world was moving more and more quickly. And he said, what is the purpose of art? And you know, the answer was, the art, the purpose of art is to make a stone feel stony. Huh. And so I think that, you know, I'm, I'm interested in that question of, of, of technique. How do you, when you've got your wonderful collages here that really are flowers and they're pulled from those palette papers and turned into something that they weren't when they were starting, when they first started them. So what is that, that technique and how do you connect technique to the beauty that you're talking about? She's <laughs> telling me what I can say. I thought she was asking. No, no, no. Are you asking me? You're asking yes, me. Yes, you're an artist. Sorry, sorry, sorry. What I said was, I would substitute technique with experience. Because I think technique has a really bad reputation, for one, but technique is necessary in terms of how to. And I think there's a point when you figure out the how to and then you take the materials, you know, process your own knowledge, what you bring to it, your history, and then it becomes about that experience and it comes into play that way to me. And I'm not so sure, I'm not saying technique isn't necessary. I think there's just a weird illusion about, or a weird definition, or a weird way of defining what technique is. It's usually like one, two, three, four to get to the five. Technique is the beauty. No, technique does not equal beauty. I mean, you can be astounded that somebody can make something, but you can walk away and you completely can't see, to me, ugh. Like a, a great art to me is something I carry once I walk away. Like if I go into a show and then I'm in the car ride, riding home and I'm thinking, I can't remember anything I just saw. To me, that's problematic. But it's also my choice to define it in that way way too. But I also think that there's oh, such a big conversation with oh, me. I don't know. Angelina, that was probably a shitty thing. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Well, Sochi Nixon talked about in his final, or his Nobel Prize lecture, about how out of truth, beauty, and goodness, those are the three, right, that beauty is the one that's most significant because it's the only one that touches our heart. So you can say with words many, many things, but there will also be somebody who says it in a different way that will kind of refute that. But the beauty or seeing something beautiful has a way of speaking true, that experience is true. And that's the kind of thing that you can't get to with technique. It's something more than that. I think, um, you know, beauty is kind of the name. Uh, you know, something that you, you when you see it, you know it. Um, but I also am thinking of, uh, as far as art, I mean, you know, I saw, a, you know, in the 90s, uh, a guy who collected just minimal art, basically, and he had a large piece, and he said, oh, this piece is just, is just about beauty, and, and it's just, that's what it's about. It was just all, you know, it was a big, large, Piece. And it was almost like an, a, he had to qualify because he had all this other minimal art. But um, I think of art for art's sake, and you know, with Whistler, um, you know, art for art's sake. You do art, and and sooner or later, you know, why do you do art? It, it's really you hope other people relate to it but you do what comes out of your heart and soul, no matter what, it's, um, it's what people think, you have to please yourself and also take those risks and do, do what you want. And the beauty comes through. I agree. Wow, this has been an incredible discussion. I, I just want to say thank you so much to our panel. Um, thank you, Stephen, Jay, Nisan, Jean, Jennifer. Thank you so much for this. This has been one of those discussions that I, I hope that we can have in this space and that we can have for our community. People can come in and
And again, we can talk about why art matters. So thank you everyone for coming out. Um, I, I just really appreciate it. So but I thank you. for providing a space like this. It is probably the only space other than the co that, that shows contemporary work and tries to promote this kind of dialogue. So could you do us a favor and please buy our, not necessarily mine, but anybody's, but also please leave your name and contact information in the guest book so that they can send you information that you can either share with your friends, participate yourself, but just spread the word about this amazing space and the work that they're doing. And thank you again.